in my day job, I get to work with a lot of really cool test equipment, stuff that's very expensive and really neat. Uh, at home, things are a little bit more modest. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about a lot of different test equipment and hopefully some stuff that either you haven't seen or haven't, aren't very experienced with. Uh, we'll look at some basic test equipment that hopefully we, we all have. Um, some equipment that you might find handy for, uh, for home brewers. We'll take a look at some power meters. Uh, antenna analyzers, we'll use it as a segue to vector network analyzers. We'll touch briefly on time domain reflectometers, RF spectrum analyzers, and then finally uh, I'll try to give you some tips on uh, how to find uh, used or surplus test equipment that won't break the bank. So basic test equipment. You know, years ago, we used to have these DLMs, VOMs, right? I still have my, my Simpson 260. Um, these days, it's all about DMMs. And you, you don't necessarily have to have one that's, you know, like this. You can have something like like that, a, uh, a cheapie from Harbor, uh, Harbor Freight. Uh, basically, I think they're really essential for troubleshooting. Think of it as like flying blind if you don't have one. And how do you know that you have power from your power supplier? How do you know that um, you know, cable's not shorted or it's not open? You really, you really need to have something like that. The basic meters will just measure voltage, current, and resistance, but some of the more advanced ones will do things like temperature, and diode checking, capacitance, inductance, and even frequency measurements. So basically, you can get any flavor you want. It just depends on what your need is. Um, dummy loads, I, I guess this is sort of test equipment. Um, dummy loads are really handy if you don't want to put a, a signal on the air uh, and, 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 and cause interference when you're testing. Uh, it's also handy when you're trying to figure out um, do I have an antenna problem or do I have a transmitter problem? You know, um, you may, as an example, uh, I had a 40 meter beam that had a bad ballon. When I used 100 watts, everything was fine. But when I had like 500 watts, the thing went crazy. So of course I take the antenna analyzer and I check and I go, the antenna's fine, it must be my transmitter. But when I put the, uh, the transmitter into a dummy load, the transmitter was fine, so I knew it was the antenna. So dummy loads can be handy. Um, there are two different varieties, the wet and the dry. The wet contains oil to, uh, uh, to cool the resistor, and the, uh, and the dry just has a heat sink. The dry ones uh, come in um, uh, different sizes, different power handling capabilities. Um, I, have a little, I have a little 20 watt one that I use for, uh, for doing some QRP stuff. And I, I do mean QRP, not, not QRO. Um, so that's dummy loads. Um, here's some equipment for home brewers. Uh, I think an oscilloscope is handy to have. Uh, it's, it's great for displaying waveforms or debugging logic circuits. Um, this is uh, 100 megahertz. That's really all you need is a 100 megahertz dual channel scope. Um, if you're going to get one, try to get one with probes because if you're going to end up having to buy probes, it's just going to up the price. Um, you can get them used for like $150. So they're handy to have. I use mine um, to, to be able to look at signals on 630 meters. I use a scope match. So it basically measures um, uh, the voltage and the current. And when, uh, when the two are in phase at 630 meters, then it means my antenna is resonant. So that's, that's probably the most common thing I do with my scope. Um, LCR meters are handy. Um, I, have a, I have a little peak one here. Um, I've had it for a while. But these are, these are great. Um, I think it was like, uh, I don't know, $100, $150 for these things. And, um, you know, when you're winding a coil... I was winding a coil for my 2200 meter transmitter and it had like, I don't know, like a hundred and some odd turns. And I'm like, was that 100 or 102 or 98 or whatever the hell it is? Like, well, 
I knew what the value had to be, so I just measured it. So these things are handy. I'll pass it around. LCR meters. Um, decade boxes. So decade boxes are, are cool to have. Um, they're sort of pricey if you got to buy them new, but you can you can get them used. Uh, so this is this is one that I think I picked up at a flea market for I don't know twenty dollars or something like that. I have a couple of these, so these are great to have. It's a little bit bigger than that, but it's cheaper. So these are some things that you may find useful if you want to put a project together. I will say about LCR meters, they're, they're really handy for measuring components and making sure that before you, you populate a board that all the components are the right value. Some may be mismarked or have a, have a wrong value. Yes? So I have a multimeter about the 20 bucks, or 10 bucks. Yeah. Are there any limits to that? Yeah. That can be handy. So I mean, this this is this is just made for measuring inductance and capacitance and resistance. It, it basically, it's uh, it's not like one of those do all things. Probably. But I mean, you know, I didn't have one of those uh, meters that would do it all. I, I needed to measure a bunch of components, so I decided to get that. So that's pretty cool. Um, but the point I was trying to make was that when you, the time to find that you have a bad component is not when you soldered all the components into the board and you're trying to figure out where's my problem. Measure everything before you install it. Make sure the, the, the component values are what they should be. And then make sure that we install the components or install properly. And you probably will have your, your circuit working, but. You mean less, you can't, you can't believe what the manufacturer put on it? Never. Never. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my bit about homebrew. Uh, power meters. So there's basically two flavors of power meters, inline and absorption. Um, the inline, as the name implies, uh, uh, you keep the meter in line during normal operation. So, you know, this is handy. Uh, if you want to look at your, your forward power or your reflected power, um, it's, it's handy if you, you know, if you, um, if you have a problem, you'll see it right away. Hopefully, um, a lot of people, what they do is they'll, they'll have it on reverse and they'll be used to what they see for reverse power. And so if it jumps up right away, they know there's an issue. Um, there's analog types and, dis and digital types. I'm showing a couple of analog ones here. Uh, they measure forward and reverse, uh, average or peak, depending on the model. Uh, and in the, in the left here, I basically have a, a Bird 43 like, like this one here. So these use uh, slugs or elements so that you can, and the elements basically determine the frequency that you can measure and the maximum power handling capability. Okay, you turn them one way for forward power and the other way for reflected. Um, so um, when I started out, I got a, a used meter and I got a 250 watt slug, but the slugs go up to like 5,000 watts if you if you so desire. I have a a 100, a 250, and a 2500 HF slug. And then uh, you can go crazy with the slugs. I mean, you can, the nice thing about the, the bird meters is you buy what you need right now. And as you build your station, you, you, you buy what you need. So it's, the investment is not a huge investment. And slugs available new? So, yeah, you, I mean, meters and slugs are available new, but, I mean, there's so much stuff on the used market right now, I wouldn't buy one new. I've never bought a, a bird meter new. So you see these at flea markets all the time, elements all the time. You know, if you're looking for a specific element, a very common, like maybe a 2,500-watt HF slug, you know, you might pay money for that or you might want to buy that new. But 
a, a, a lot of the slugs you can you can buy used. Um, so the so the bird forty three is I, I like it, but uh, an, an option uh, is the Daiwa. People like the Daiwa because it's self contained. You don't have to buy slugs. It does HF, and I think it might actually go to six meters as well. Um, it's got switchable range for the for the you know maximum power. It's dual meter so that you can see forward and reverse at the same time. Yeah. They're supposed to be accurate to within like 5%, which I think is, is what the bird is. But I, I've never have had one. I know they're popular, though. Huh. I know you can send the birds out and have them calibrated, but you got to send them with the slugs because it's basically the... The slugs that they adjust. Yeah. You sure MFJ didn't make it? <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, inline uh, uh, power meters. Absorption. These are popular with the UHF and microwave community. Um, they're basically commercial power meters that are obsolete because nobody can afford ten thousand dollars for a new power meter it's just out of the budget of most people so these things basically have heads have sensors and the sensors you connect to whatever you're measuring and the sensors determine uh, the frequency range of the maximum power handling capability and that maximum power is typically like one watt you think to yourself what the hell am i going to measure one watt that's crazy right well, people, what they do is they use directional couplers and attenuators to basically get the power down to a level that they can, can read it. And so they know, geez, I got a 20 dB coupler and I got a 10 dB pad. I'm 30 dB down. So if I'm measuring one watt, I must have, you know. So that's how they do that. Um, so this, it's if you're building microwave gear or UHF gear, you're building your own equipment, you know, that's that's probably... Uh, what you're looking for. The meters used can be like $100 for some of them. Uh, the sensors can be like a couple hundred dollars or more because typically what goes is the sensor. People uh, overpower the sensor without knowing it. Oops. And then the sensor's garbage. So that's um, power meters. Antenna analyzers, probably one of my favorites. Um, these are really critical for uh, measuring your antenna system, adjusting your antenna. Uh, they're also helpful for cutting uh, phasing lines. Uh, you know, if you basically put a, a short at the end of a cable or an open, you can, you know, and you know the velocity factor, you can basically cut the cable to the to a quarter wavelength or a half wavelength. Um, I show two here: the the, the MFJ one, mighty fine junk. Um, the old 259 series, I still have that. This one I modified for uh, 630 and 2200 meters. It just wound two more coils, and I have a switch, so it's like everything else, and then 630 or 2200. Um, I had that for the longest time. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things, for better or worse, it is, you know, the 259 series. They're large. I think there's like 10 batteries in these things. These things eat batteries. And it's large enough that it's sort of difficult to, to bring up a tower, although I've done that before. You put it in a bucket and you raise it up the tower, um, and then you pray like hell you don't drop it. Um, the other one here is, is a Rig Expert that I'm showing. These are just two of the more popular ones. I like the Rig Expert. It's got like a sealed membrane, so it's water resistant. It's very lightweight. It's got a graphical display. Um, it's got a, a USB port. You can hook it to a computer. Um, it comes with some software uh, so that you can you can plot things. So it's sort of handy. And it's made in Ukraine. And it's made in the Ukraine, right? And I run, and keep your eye on the price for a, a later conversation. Both of these new are three hundred and fifty dollars. I didn't pay that for that. I think I got it on sale for probably, at the time, maybe a couple hundred dollars at HRO. But that's what they go for new, 350 bucks. And all you can do is measure your antenna. It seems like a lot of money, doesn't it?
Seems like a lot, a lot of money to me. Now think of the antenna analyzer as a, a one port vector analyzer. So these are some plots with the antenna scope software that comes with the rig expert. I say it comes with it, you download it for free. Um, some things I don't like. I wish I could change the maximum scale because, oh, I care about this. I don't care about all this wasted space. So that's the SWR. That's the, uh, the reactance, resistance, and impedance, and then a Smith chart. So that's, can't do that with the MFJ, huh? For the 259 series. All right, vector network analyzers. So vector network analyzers measure S parameters, their amplitude and phase. So they measure of different RF devices. They're, the most common one is this, is this two port. This is a commercial piece of test equipment. You can measure gain or loss. Um, you can measure reflection coefficients and display them as visoir or return loss. Uh, you can measure com complex impedances. Uh, and you can also use it as a pretty darn accurate signal source because after all, you have one, one source with, which is a, a generator, a signal generator. One thing I wanna uh, you know, point out is to make accurate measurements, you gotta calibrate these things. Okay, so if you're, if you're thinking you just make measurements without calibrating, you're wrong. Um, so this is a setup here, a VNA and a, and a dot, so uh, here, if if the if source if the source one on the VNA is uh, is the output, you have a signal that goes through here, and so that that signal is some of it gets reflected, and that's your S11 measurement. So that would be the return loss or the visoir. The signal that goes through there and comes back to port two, that would be your your transmission or your S21. That would be your gain or your loss through the device. Uh, in uh, in this case. Uh, you would uh, you would have a, a relay system in the in the PNA where you would swap port one for port two as the source, and you would run your signal through here. So you'd have some reflection coming back here. That's your S two two, your uh, visoir or your return loss, and then you'd have the signal that goes through here and comes back, uh, and that would be your your S one two. So the way to think of this is the up here. When we talk about S21, and the, and the, and the wording's wrong here, it, the signal comes from 1 to 2. When we talk about an S21 measurement, it comes from 1 to 2. And S21 would be from 2 to 1. So that's some basics about a vector network analyzer. Any questions? A lot of money, more than you have. Probably... 40,000, 20,000, 20,000, I'm going to guess. But you don't have to spend that kind of money. Vector network analyzers. These things came out some a uh, few years ago, and they're fantastic. I can't say enough about them. We saw the $350 vector network analyzer, or I should say the antenna analyzer, 350 bucks, And you can do more with this $60 handheld analyzer than you could ever do with that. So there's two of them out, the, uh, the original one, the Model H, and the Model H4. So the Model H is the one that I have. It goes to 900 meg. Uh, the H, and it's, it's got a small screen. It's, that's probably one of the major drawbacks is the small screen. It's 2.8 inch screen. Uh, and, the, and the H1, or the H4 rather, uh, over here, it's got a nice big 4 inch screen. Um, but other than that, the specs are about the same. I will say that the H4 goes to 1.5 gigahertz, it's a little bit higher, so it covers the 1296 band, if you, if you so desire. Um, but it's pretty much comparable. One thing is, it's, you're limited to 101 points, so that can be a little bit of a drawback. When you're, when you're measuring things, you tend to keep your bandwidth narrow, so you have the 101 points where you, where you need them. If you, put, if you go like full span, it doesn't really look very good. I didn't, but you know what I did do is the thing freaked out at some point in time, and I couldn't see shit. Uh -huh. And I ended up looking on the on the internet and found out how you can reset the software. Uh -huh. 
and it actually brought it back. Now with the H4, it's totally the firmware update that'll give you more points. Okay. Nice. Okay. That's good. Yeah, I don't. Th I, is that true for the the old one, the no. the original one, or the or the H four? Yeah, I'm too I'm too cheap to to replace this for the extra whatever ninety dollars or whatever. I may off the tower. Yeah. Hundred hundred one points. Now you can display more on the computer. Right, right, right. So the the other uh, distinct difference is the bigger battery with the H4, obviously, because you have a bigger display. But you know, I got to tell you, for sixty or ninety dollars, how can you go wrong? I, I mean. $350 or under $100. I could buy like three of these and give them out to my friends. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so the, in, the, in the firmware upgrade, uh, the upper frequency range of the H4 goes to 2.7 gigahertz. So now you can go up to 2304. Mm -hmm. Yes, it can be. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. I think it puts out uh, what minus thirteen or something, or minus fifteen dBm. It's not a lot of power, but yeah, sure, sure. So. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's important to remember you got to calibrate before you make a measurement. So um, when you are, are using a, a, a nano VNA, if you're just using it like an antenna analyzer, you're making S11 measurements, you just need to use the, the short and the open and the low that, that came with it. Uh, if you're making um, gain or loss measurements, now you got to also use the RF cable for the through and no cable for the isolation. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a menu-driven system. You, you select, you know, you connect your thing, you hit short, you connect the thing, hit load. And you, when you're all done, you can save it in one of four memories and then recall it when you, when you need to. How often should you recalibrate if you're doing the same thing? Not really sure. I imagine over time the thing drifts. So, yes, yes. So, you know, it's sort of, it's, what's nice is just, do the calibration just before you make the measurement. And then, right, right. So um, one of the problems that, the, that I had was I, I would do these calibrations, and these things, these little, this little calculate is so small, I'd forever be dropping stuff, and of course it would roll where I couldn't get it. I'm, I'm trying to find the goddamn thing. And uh, of course, you know, without all three of those, you're pretty much SOL, right? And I don't mean show, sh uh, short open load. So I built this this sort of homebrew cal kit. So uh, I think I went on Express PCB and I designed the board. Like it doesn't take very long, uh, and and you do like I don't know three of these on a single board, then you cut them out. And so this basically has uh, SMA mails on the corners. I have a short here. I just soldered. There's my open. And over here, you can't see it, but there's a, a couple of 100 ohm surface mount resistors from center to ground, so it's 50 ohms. And I brought it into work. I wondered, like, how how well would this work as a cal kit? I mean, would it work as good as that? You know, it was pretty damn good up to like you know, two or three gigahertz. You know, where where you start to see like the distance from from the connector to the solder and all. Where now it starts to but up to like two or three gigahertz, it was fine. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Not entirely, but there's not a whole lot there. Yeah. Right. Because it's a surface mount. Yeah, it's little, like a, I don't know, an 0604, a little surface mount resistor. It's a bitch to solder. 
Well, yeah, I, you're right. Um, and, I, and I bet it was so small I wouldn't even be able to measure anything. Um, that's one of the limitations. So for under $30, I made myself a calc kit. So if anybody's interested, I, I have more of those PC boards. Um, here are some examples of measurements that you can make with uh, a nano VNA. So these measurements uh, are, are, are shown with the, the, the software that comes with the nano VNA that you download. So, um, I mean, this software is a little bit better than the, the, the stuff that comes with the, with the uh, antenna analyzer, the, you know, the rig, the rig expert. But this is my, basically my tri-bander on 10 meters. So you can see here that, you know, two to one is about here. So at 28 megahertz, it's just under 1.4. At 28.9, it's 1.1 uh, 1 .1 or thereabouts. And then up at like 29.08, it goes to two. So it's, it's useful up to there. And you can see all the different points. There's a lot of information that they, that they give you here. You have your quality factor, your return loss, your series inductance and capacitance, your parallel resistance, your parallel uh, reactance, uh, your complex impedance here. It's actually a lot of information. And over here on the right is the Smith chart, if you're, if you're so inclined. So, you know, this is what you get for like $60. How can you go wrong? I think we, we should all buy one. Right. Okay. Here's uh, some, some uh, measurements of the, remember the, the, the ugly filters from Field Day? So these are two of the ugly filters. This is the 40 meter one on the left and the 15 meter one on the right. I know you can't see the, you know, the, the data, it's uh, too small, but the important stuff is right here. So the, the 40 meter ugly filter, the insertion loss is 0.5 dB. Rejection at the next band down, which is 80 meters, is 39. The next band up that we use for field day is 20 meters. That's 44.5 dB. And on the right, uh, the, again, the insertion loss at 15 meters is 0.5 dB. And then the next band down that we use is 20. That's 35 dB. And then the next band up that we use is 10 meters. It's 44 dB. So these are the measurements that you can make with this $60 piece of equipment. Just phenomenal. You tell me. <laughs> you tell me, Bruce. <laughs> By the way, I'll 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 let you use my my nano VNA to test it. <laughs> that's, that's very impressive. Yeah. The, the, you know, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah. 500 bucks. 500 bucks. And, uh, nice I can give you this one for 490. The nice thing about the microwave is that you don't have a display. Yeah. That so you put the uh, computer on your internet and push your internet. You use your cell phone to display the display. Well, that's, that's, that's worth the $500 right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time domain reflectometers. So I have to say that, uh, I don't know, six months or a year ago when I was thinking about this presentation, I thought to myself, geez, I should look into to TDRs. So TDRs are really neat. Uh, they detect faults, uh, uh, the location of faults on coax cable. Um, basically, the way it works is you send a pulse down the cable, and that reflected pulse and the, and the pulse you sent down, you display on a, on a oscilloscope. And if you know the velocity factor of the cable, you can calculate the distance from that first pulse to the reflection. And if, you're, if you have a short, that reflection is going to be negative. And if you have an open, that reflection is going to be positive. And if you have something in between, just a mismatch, it's going to be something in between. So those are like typical waveforms for a, for a TDR. You can make a simple TDR with a... Uh, a fast edge pulse generator and a scope. I've tried that. I haven't had good success. Oh, wonderful. So, geez, maybe the, for $350 it's worth it, huh? Or maybe not, because you can do a TDR with your nano VNA. 
So this is this is the original Nano VNA, and basically what I've done is I've hooked a, a, a coax cable from my shack, and I've taken that cal kit that I mentioned, and I've uh, installed it on the end of the cable. So and I've I've entered the velocity factor of that cable, and see right here, three meters. That's basically where where the fault is, where the, where the short is. And just like I showed you on the previous screen, it's a negative reflection. And if I put an open, it's a positive reflection. And if I put a load, you have a little bit of a discontinuity. And I've put a Smith chart behind, on a, on a second trace behind the TDR measurement. So you can see what the, what the match is. In there. So you can use a nano VNA as a, as a TDR. What are its limitations? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. But my, my goal was, hey, geez, I wonder if you can do this. At the very least, you can see if, you're, if your cables in your shack have any, any problems. But what would be interesting is if you had a, like a 100-foot piece of coax and you tried to do this, what would it look like? Would it be useful on a, on a longer length of cable? All right, RF spectrum analyzers. Once thought to only be, you know, expensive pieces of equipment that uh, none of us could afford. This is, uh, I, I, I was hoping Skip would come because Skip used to have one of these, an old uh, HP-141T. So these things can be bought used for a couple of thousand dollars. They're really old. Old as the hills. They built blind the Marconi Museum. Um, they measure the strength of an input signal versus the frequency. So on your x-axis, you would have your frequency. And on the y-axis, you'd have your amplitude. Uh, you can do a lot of things with them. You can measure the amplitude of a signal, the harmonics of the signal. You can look at spectral purity. You can measure phase noise. You can measure FM deviation. You can do a lot of things with this thing. Um, the way these things work Basic is you apply a signal to the input. You have a, an attenuator here that you adjust so that you don't overdrive the analyzer. You have a pre-selector so that you can uh, filter out unwanted signals. And those signals get mixed with a local oscillator that is tied to your reference so it's stable. And then you have a, an adjustable IF gain amplifier, another uh, attenuator, and another filter to get, to, to get rid of the mixing products. You feed it to a log amplifier, an envelope detector, finally a video filter, and you display it. And the way the, the sweep generator is sweeping uh, across the frequency between the start and the stop frequency, and you're basically seeing your, your signal. So over here, taking that concept, you know, this is, this is I don't know what frequency it is, but could be the calibrator, could be something else. But that's, that's basically how these things work. So the tiny SA spectrum analyzers, again, these are really cool. This is much like the nano VNA. I got one of these about six months ago. I thought to myself, you know, I should try this. Um, the, unlike the nano VNA, I decided I wasn't going to go and, 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 and be cheap about it. I was, I was going to pay the extra money and get the four-inch screen, which I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, the two are, are, have a, about the same specifications. Like They both go to about like 900 meg, but there's also an ultra mode where you can go up to 6 gigahertz, which is really pretty neat. You get a 6 gigahertz spectrum analyzer for $140. That's not bad. Um, specs, the other specs are about the same. Um, the Ultra has got an LNA. It's got a 20 dB LNA. Also, it's got a, a lower noise floor. You can see much farther down. It's got that bigger display and, and the larger battery. And, uh, you know, comes with a little cutesy antenna here. So you can do all sorts of neat stuff. Here, I'll pass that around. Yeah, yeah, you can do that as well. So these things are pretty cool. I mean, they're very powerful, but you also can be, you can go off into the weeds without, without too much effort. So you got to be careful. So 
Um, I use mine to basically look at like the noise floor in my area so I can tell, all right, so everything's sort of working right now. And I save that and I go back and if there's a problem, I go, well, wait a minute, the noise floor was this. What the hell happened? That's one of the major reasons I got it. Um, here's some uh, measurements you can make. Um, on the left here is uh, the output of my K3S on six meters. We're basically on uh, the FT8 frequency, and uh, I just want to put a tone up. So here's the spectral purity. Can't see it that well, but this is down about 50 dB. So this is looking, uh, I don't know, 200 kilohertz maybe? Yeah, about, about 200 kilohertz. So that's the spectral purity. And this is using the tiny SA software that you can download for the tiny SA uh, spectrum analyzer. And then on, on the right is my noise floor. So I basically what I've done here is I've, I've connected the analyzer to my two meter antenna and I've turned the beam, I, I have a, a pair of beams on 12 meters. I've turned it to the southwest, which is like a favorable direction. Uh, and this is what I'm seeing. So there's, there's somebody down here, so that's a real signal. There is something going on up here, I'm not sure what that is. Um, that's around, uh, I don't know, 380, I don't know, maybe a repeater or something? I don't know. Seems to be a, a, a little bit low for that. And then there's a the signal up here, but if you look at the noise floor, noise floor is about 1, 123. It basically says if I can see a signal that's above 123, I ought to be able to hear it. So I have one of those little RPL SDRs. Yep. Is that similar to these in the way you can stuff on the computer? I think so. I, I don't think it's got as much gain. Yeah. So I don't think you can see it down as far, but that's certainly um, an inexpensive way to go. Yeah. Um, although you can get the, the smaller version of these things that. Pretty yeah, pretty, pretty much. So these are two examples uh, of measurements you can make with the with that tiny SA. So sort of pretty pretty neat stuff. I'm I'm still experimenting with it a little bit more. Uh, finally, I wanted to give a, a few tips on, on on where to find used and surplus test equipment and like some tips because you can spend a lot of money and get taken. So don't do that. Um, first place I'd look would be flea markets. The MIT flea market is uh, on Sundays from April through October. Uh, of course, near fest, you sometimes find equipment. I mean, I think I probably found, I probably found this at near fest. Um, I think this was given to me. Um, and ham expo exposition, again, these are, these are three places that you can find stuff, uh, th three flea markets you can find stuff. Online, sometimes you can find equipment at EHAM or QTH. Uh, you can find a lot of uh, equipment on eBay, but you got to be really careful. There's a lot of people selling hot things. There's a lot, a lot of people telling you it works and it doesn't work. You got to be really, really careful. Buyer beware. So some things you may want to ask the seller before you make an offer. Hey, uh, is, is the instrument in good working condition? What's wrong with it? Uh, you know, are you the original owner? Probably not. Uh, why are you selling it? I've heard all sorts of stories. Um, one, uh, one thing I like to ask people is, when was the instrument last calibrated? It's going to be, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, calibration? What's that? Because, I mean, th that becomes a point of leverage when you, when you want to buy it. I don't think it's ever been calibrated. Well, how do you know it's accurate? Um, yeah, because the guy that I bought it from like 20 years ago whew, said so. Now, if you're at a flea market, yeah, exactly. Now, if you're at a flea market, you might ask the seller, there's an outlet over there. Can we plug it in? Can we see if it even works? You know, bring a, bring a little AC uh, cable with you. Uh, and also ask, I asked before, I mentioned before about, uh, about, um, Probes for scopes. Ask what accessories come with the come with the instrument. You know, like if I got to buy a scope and it's one hundred and fifty dollars, but then I got to buy two probes and 
the probes are $150, just double the cost of the instrument. Okay? Yes? Yes. Yeah, you gotta you gotta open it and, and take a look first. Uh, you you may find bulging caps. Bulging caps are no good. Anyway, that's my presentation. Any questions? Uh, okay. Russ, have you tried any of the online auctions? Like eBay? No. No, I haven't. Like professional. Uh, let me give you a person. Shul Shulman Auction. I did dot com is one that I subscribe. To. So there's an auction going on right now, um, an HP 8591E spectrum analyzer. Yep, that's, that's, yeah, that's like a little portable one. So the current, the current bid on this is $380. That's not bad. Okay, and so... It's got a CRT, so... Yeah, on hand equipment, a lot of times there's a lot of people that will be getting okay? Yep. So I don't find the hand equipment be tremendously good value, but sometimes you'll find like there'll be a box of stuff and they'll take a picture. Yeah. And you just bid on the box. And I bid on one that was like, it must have been uh, 20 Benjamin Adels in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know I made money on that. You know. <clears throat> so, but I'm testing them and I'm curious because hands may not necessarily buy sophisticated test equipment. And these auctions that you're for hands, okay? Yeah. They tend to buy equipment, not buy the test equipment. So uh, that's why I was asking. So one, one of the other things I wanted to point out is that you don't have to buy all, all your test equipment at once. Buy what you need right now. I think everybody ought to have a DMM. I think everybody ought to have a dummy load. I mean, these things are essential, I would think. Um, I think everybody ought to have something to measure your antenna with. These things are phenomenal. Um, but the rest of it, you, you buy it as you need to. Uh, I just got today a sequence. Uh, it was, uh, yep. Yeah, they can be expensive, some of the complex ones. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Hey, and by the way, you can, this, you can trade up as you go. Yes, so yes. In other words, you look for something that's better than what you currently have at a great price, and then as soon as you snag it, you then list your older exactly. price, and you may be able to, you may be better at buying. You know, buying, buy low, sell high. So if, if I sold this for $100, I, I bet I could sell this for $100 on EHAM. I could buy a nice 4-inch one of these and have money left over. But really, you said that your, uh, your balance at 100 watts worked well. Yeah. Could yeah. Could you explain that to me? Yeah, so I, I bought a high-gain balance. I cheaped out. I bought a balance that was supposed to be good for 1,500 watts, and for a while it was. And something broke down in it. Now, i got to tell you where the balance was. I have, a, I have an 80-foot tower, and I have a tri-meter at the, at the top of the tower, and then 12 feet above it on a mast, I have a 40-meter beam, or I had a 40-meter beam. The balance on that 40-meter beam went bad. I put this thing up with a crane. So I had basically, we, we, we put the mast into the tower, and then we put the 40-meter beam on, and then we raised the mast out of the tower, put it into the rotor, and then we put the trod band around. There was no way I was going to be able to get to that 40-meter that beam. Is there an element without on the boom? It's not a yeah. mast like a three-element tri Two elements on what? A point yeah, it's yeah, something like that. You know? so, so it's like it's number one. It's twelve feet up, and it's you know so many feet out. There's no way I was getting to that ballon. So I had to hire Matt Matt Strelo, KC1XX. By the way, common. It's a common known failure that people do. Yeah. Is that you 
on development coordinator Yadis. You make sure that whatever balance you put out there is not going to fail. Is the biggest one you can find. So that, I replaced that with a five kilowatt ballon. It never went bad again. No, no. So, again, before I was mentioning the story, I was able to figure out, well, it's not the antenna per se. When it's, it's power related, it's not my transmitter. It's got to be something in the antenna. Well, what's in the antenna that changes? Got to be the ballon. Could be the coax. I doubt it. More likely the ballon. So, buyer beware. Element, uh, yeah. So what I what before I put it up, I did the the lease and mods. So all those I went through all those things. So I suppose it could have been, but it wasn't. wasn't. So Matt was funny. Matt comes over. He's the German guy and. And you know, we're, we're, we're talking and uh, big contester. And I said, you know, Matt, why don't you like enter some of the domestic contest? You seem to only be interested in the international contest. He goes, you can only talk to so many people from like Iowa. <laughs> he had these one liners. I remember being at Dayton with uh, uh, K1NU and K1OA. And we, we've all had Matt do work for us. And over a few beers, we're just shooting out these, these one-liners. Funny as all hell. Uh, at one time, Matt, um, I think Matt lived in Chelmsford. And uh, he, he lived in a two-family. And a woman with a young child was next door. So Matt would do these these multi-multi things. He, he had towers in the backyard. And, they, and at this point in time, there was RFI. He would cause a lot of RFI. So, you know, the, the poor woman would come over and knock on the door. Hey, you're bothering my TV. And what, what does Matt say? I suggest you do something different this weekend. <laughs> so that's Matt. So Matt came over and fixed, fixed my, uh, my, my antenna. Um, it was the most crazy thing I've ever seen anybody do. So Matt's, uh, Matt's guy, Andrew, put these laces up the, the mast and climbed the mast. And then built it into the mast, took the antenna off, and trammed it down to, to Matt on the ground. They replaced the ballon, and one-handed, you know, Matt basically pulled the whole thing back up to the tower, and they put it on. It was the most amazing thing. That was worth the money. I think at the time it was, Matt was charging $100 an hour, four-hour minimum. So it cost me 400 bucks, and the show was well worth it. I should have. I should have. They're divorced now, you know. Yes. So, uh, so uh, his triplets used to go to the to the dance, the, the, yeah, dance place in Townsend, and so I used to see him, him and his daughters at the. And then I found out later that he got divorced. Now he's shacking up with somebody in Colombia, Caribbean. I forget. Well, we've all heard the stories. Years ago. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, so down in the Caribbean. So, I don't know. That's right. And, and his daughter, I think, might have been in the same class or maybe a different one. Anyway. So Matt, Matt is a very interesting guy. A little eccentric, but very interesting. All right, thanks, folks. Thanks a lot.